topic for the next panel discussion will be creating meaningful consumer connections and delivering omni-channel experiences. The session will be chaired by Praveen Ramachandra, head of South India, Kantar. I request him to be ready with the other panelists. And also, the panel members now, we have Abhinav Vadrev, Senior Director of Marketing, Rupik. Please put your hands together. Ashish Mishra, Executive Vice President, Marketing, ACO. My client meets me here. I don't find them anywhere else. But. Karthikeya Bhandari, Chief Marketing Officer, Live Space. We'll also be joined by P. Madhavan, Executive Vice President, Sales and Marketing, TVS, Sri Chakra Limited. And also we have Vanda Ferraro, Head of Marketing, Fresh to Home Foods. I'm saying that we'll just meet at events. Okay, uh, you can hear me all right at the back? Yeah, so thank you for the introductions, and uh, it's great to have an esteemed uh, panel today for this discussion just before lunch. Uh, so we hopefully we have, to, we have a good engagement just before we get on break for the lunch. Uh, so the topic here today that we are talking about is in terms of omnichannel experiences and how can we provide consumers uh, with meaningful connections throughout this experience, throughout the consumer journey experience. And uh, I'd like to start off with uh, what has happened over the last couple of years, which is obviously with the pandemic and lockdowns, the uh, consumer behavior itself has changed dramatically. And uh, it has forced all of you marketers to sort of uh, adapt and uh, very quickly at that in terms of how you can reach out to the consumer and how you can make it a very seamless experience for them. Uh, Starting with that, so let me start with that, and I think uh, I'd like to ask you a question in terms of what does Omnichannel mean for each of your brands, and we'll go one by one. Uh, but uh, we'd like to start off by asking, uh, how has the pandemic changed it over the last couple of years in terms of what it means to provide an Omnichannel experience uh, for consumers? And that would be the first part of the uh, agenda for the discussion today. Uh, the second and third parts, what I'd like to get on is then focus on brand building and communication, specifically how do you build a brand in this, in this, uh, in, in the, with this omnichannel strategy. Uh, then moving on to the role of technology and innovation and how it aids it. And finally, your views, we'll sign off with your views in terms of what it means for the future. So that's broken into four parts, and that's how I'd like to divide the agenda for today. Uh, let me start off with uh, maybe the fintech brands. Uh, Ashish, if you'd like to go first and try and answer that uh, in terms of how has the pandemic changed uh, business for you over the last couple of years, what have been the challenges in terms of sticking to an omnichannel strategy for your brand? Uh, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> uh, first of all, I think pandemic, uh, we are a D2C brand. We were always online. And uh, pandemic changed a lot of consumer habits. People were more willing to uh, shop online and try new things. So. We, we definitely benefited from the change in consumer behavior, and, uh, and that's, that's what we have no, uh, noticed over the last couple of years. For us, uh, as an online brand, right, uh, Omnichannel for me is, 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 is providing the same experience that the consumer gets when they buy us, and also the same experience when it comes to, you know, a, a, let's say a claim or, you know, renewal. So for, if you, I'm setting large expectations when you're buying me and with the, with the ease of which we are, you're buying us, I have to deliver the same experience when it comes to uh, on the offline version. So that's, that's for us is a great uh, uh, benchmark metric to keep track of. Yeah, so did you feel that it had to change over the last couple of years, Ashish, in any way? Or uh, do you feel it was just business as usual during the, during the lockdowns? Of, the oh, of course. Uh, it, it, the, <coughs> the first wave of COVID, I mean, it did impact. Um, car insurance was not on top of mind of a lot of people <laughs> at yeah. that point of time. But yeah, uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, we saw a surge post the first wave because people were realizing, okay, this, this might be a longer, <laughs> longer, we are in for a long haul. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it did affect us, but I, I'm glad to say the worst is over and it's back, it's behind us. Thank you, thank you, Ashish. Uh, going on to Abhinav, uh, Rupik, uh, very different business that you're in in terms of uh, gold loans, and uh, how, did, how does this work for you right now, and how, what were the challenges you faced over the last couple of years? Uh, 
I think, uh, first of all, we are also an online uh, first brand. So, in fact, I should say we only found Tailwind um, because gold as an asset class also tends to do well um, in, in tough times. So we found a lot of tailwind uh, during the pandemic year. As far as omni-channel is concerned, I think uh, we always wanted to, because gold is so precious for uh, Indian families, it has a lot of emotional value. People always wanted their gold to be close to them. So being a digital first brand, you know, we had to marry that with being close to them. So had to choose our marketing pipes, media pipes, uh, the kind of product features we have in terms of fulfilling uh, the demand to the customer, the kind of uh, tech stack that we built to cater to those needs. All of them had to keep this, uh, you know, RRR mantra in mind, not the movie, but the real resonant and relevant uh, for the consumer. So that's how we think about it. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Abhinav. Uh, Vanta, if I can just move over to you and ask you, uh, over the last couple of years, what were the challenges? How did you overcome that uh, in terms of an omni-channel strategy for Fresh to Home? Thank you. I think uh, the first part of your question was, uh, what is omni-channel yeah. approach? So I think the textbook definition of omni-channel is uh, the strategy of uh, lead generation and uh, user engagement a company does for its products and services. Uh, across platforms, devices, and channels. I think that's a very, very important thing to know, uh, especially for Fresh to Home. So Fresh to Home is the world's largest vertically integrated meat and seafood company. Uh, we go to 180 cities in India and the Middle East, and we are in the business of fresh and not frozen. So all this is actually a huge logistics uh, challenge for multiple reasons, because yes, meat, seafood comes from different coasts. We go to 300 coasts across the country, from Andamans to Gujarat. So imagine the logistics nightmare there. The consumers also are different, because how a Bengali, Malayali, Punjabi eats is very, very different. And now there is also the channels which you have to go and you know uh, fulfill from these consumers. And I think the pandemic has actually thrown up a lot of interesting uh, opportunities, I would actually say. While Ashish did mention that uh, they are an online brand and they were already present, I think for Fresh to Home, what really worked is uh, we saw a huge influx of consumers coming to us. We were already online, but in terms of channels, right, we took retail very, very strongly and we had to open retail stores. Um, so in terms of where we sell, we have our own platforms, our app, our website. We sell on channel partners like Danzo, Swiggy, et cetera. But retail was the biggest foray which we actually had to make because in terms of a category, meat and seafood is very touch and feel. So the pandemic brought a huge exodus of people uh, to our platforms, which we could also fulfill. But retention was very important and therefore for us, scoping the next million, we saw retail as a channel opening up really, really I a big way. And the challenge also was across all these channels, right? How do we provide a seamless experience? How do we tell the consumers about the product? So that's an endeavor, we, it's a continuous process. And in a nutshell, this is what we actually went through. Great, thank you for sharing, Mandi. Yeah, uh, let me move on to Karthik and uh, Madhavan after that. Uh, slightly different businesses in furniture and then tires uh, compared to the online first brands that we have spoken about already. <laughs> so yeah. Karthik, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, how, sure. did, how did uh, Live Space and furniture as a business overcome all the challenges? Yeah, so I'll make a slight correction. Yeah, sure. um, I think we're more than furniture. So Live Space okay, is uh, in yeah. uh, home interiors and renovation, right? That's okay. what we, that's what we do. And um, the uh, there was an interesting dichotomy during the the COVID time period. So obviously, um, it's it's a digital first brand in the sense that uh, it was thought through. Most of our demand comes through digitally, but the consumer journey is such that you have to have a physical presence as well, right? It's, a, it's like, like when I said it for us as well, it's a, it's a touch and feel business. You want to see the materials, the swatches, the samples. Um, without that, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonably high um, ticket size uh, purchase. People are unwilling to just go out, go out on a limp and, and, and make a decision without seeing uh, certain things. Um, so. Uh, what was interesting for us, this is the dichotomy, what was interesting for us was that um, obviously uh, physical interaction was limited, at least in the initial phases, but because people were spending so much time at their homes, uh, demand was also soaring because people felt the requirement that the homes need to be a lot more than what they were doing beyond that. Right? It, they need to have a multiplicity of roles, need, need to double up as either a gym or a workstation, 
uh, they need to be your sort of, uh, you know, um, <laughs> oasis of, of calm and quiet. So I think that uh, realization really helped us from a perspective of people wanting to do more with their homes. Uh, and since that's the, that's the area we play in, it was, it, was, um, it was very encouraging to see that. So it did help us uh, once the, you know, the, the restrictions and the limitations were removed, uh, we saw quite a big spike in terms of people coming to us. Uh, in terms of the journey, I think, uh, like I mentioned briefly, I think it's, uh, we've, we're always an omni-channel player. There is no other option. You start, you can, you can start digitally, uh, through you know social media or Google or whatever, or you can walk into our centers. Uh, we work with partners. Uh, we have a huge referral program as well, where people who've worked with us in the past they refer us to others. Uh, but all of them converge at some point of time at the experience centers. So I think that's the journey. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a very very hugely important aspect of uh, uh, our business. And uh, you know, uh, pre-pandemic we were in eight to 10 cities, now we're in about 34, so uh, yeah, that's how it's operated, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a great um, example of how to turn a challenge into an opportunity in terms of during the lockdowns, how you managed to do that. Um, Madhavan, if I can move over to you and uh, ask you to share your experiences in terms of how you overcame the challenges. Thanks, thanks I mean, uh, coming in last always is a problem, right? I mean, most of the points that you thought of uh, have been spoken of. And <laughs> I'll start with you uh, next, yes. I'm happy my name uh, started at the end because as middle of the class, neither A nor B, <laughs> right. Uh, I work with the TVS uh, Eurogrip, the holding company is Chakra. We are in the tires business. I take care of the global sales and marketing uh, effort for them. Uh, it's a different category altogether, right? So most of my, my purchase happens, uh, we call it grudge purchase. It's never a happy moment when you're buying a tire. In the middle of the road, you're stuck. You, you uh, grime, heat, dust, and you're rushing, and that's when something fails. So it's, for us, it's not an option. Going with one channel, is a, the, from the physical channel point of view, one channel is not an option at all. So we have to be present. So that's the first problem. Second, or first challenge, problem is a bad word. Second is the diversity in the demographics that we deal with, right? The consumers between 18, 19, till about 60, 70, I mean, everybody who uh, wants to be independent is riding a two-wheeler. Now, all of them consume media differently, and it, I can't take, I mean, millennials absolutely shun television. And uh, print, I don't know whether they're also aware that there is something called print there. And outdoors are a reminder medium, it's not the mainstream uh, uh, brand building medium. So the challenges for us are uh, en enormous there, so we need to see who we are talking to, how do we reach them, the digital side, how do we reach the 18 to 30, 32 year olds, how do we reach them? Then the 30 to 45, 50 or 60 differently. So the, for us, it's, it's, we have to be there everywhere, one. How did COVID impact the physical channels? Yes, uh, the play changed dramatically. The salesmen weren't going into the shops, picking up orders. The retailers didn't know how to reach place orders and get it in time. So we, we had started work uh, on introducing a retail application for retailer to download in their mobile and then start placing order. We thought this is not an evolved uh, uh, category, therefore they may not accept it easily. And lo and behold, in about three months time, about 20,000 retailers downloaded, allowed us to down push it in, they downloaded, started placing order. At the point, peak of COVID, 20% of my business came from uh, uh, the application there. So they were willing to accept uh, uh, the channel there. And also, India Inc. at that time was um, also not jumping and buying new uh, vehicles. So the older one had, had to be refurbished, repaired. So we were one of those who benefited when uh, that happened. In every misery, there's an opportunity also. Sadly, but truthfully, yes, that's what is. I believe we took advantage. We saw a 20, 30% increase in business during that period. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I think I'll start the next round with you, Madhavan, <laughs> in terms of the question. So you did a uh, very, uh, you had a great task in terms of building the Eurogrip brand and differentiating that from TBS over the last couple of years. And that's a journey you started. We were just speaking about it a couple of years back, two, three years back. Uh, one of the things that we have seen at Cantor is how it's important to build a very meaningful and different brand uh, in order for your brand to grow equity in the long term. Uh, so given this current situation where, you, where consumers are having journeys which are completely omnichannel, uh, 
I'd like to get start you for start with you and ask you what are your thoughts in terms of building a very meaningful and different brand in this omnichannel world. Uh, that's part one. And the second part of the question is on the communication that goes along with it in terms of having a very clear and consistent communication across very different touch points that you have to reach the consumer with uh, during this during this particular time. So love to get your thoughts. Uh, start with you, and then I'll ask all the others as well in terms of how you manage to do that. What are the challenges? Um, go ahead first, yeah. Foot in the mouth, basically, so <laughs> I'll go. Right. Uh, brand is about two, two and a half years old now. Just as we launched Eurogrip, COVID came down. Under six months, COVID happened. So we just put in a lot of money. Then as we were about to reap the benefits, uh, uh, we saw markets going down, business going down, shut completely, right? Uh, but what the tenets were very clear, what we were going to work on, what we believed were very clear. So we continued uh, on that part. See, to be different for the sake of being different is the most dangerous thing there, right? We picked, for, for, for a regular consumer, it's black round. But what, what all it does, how does it, I mean, it's, it's the only thing that keeps them uh, safe between the road and where he's sitting. Now, we, we have to educate him, saying, if this is, if these are the kinds of roads that you travel on, this is the kind of tires that you need. And the purpose needs to be clear. You can't sell an off-roader to a person who is uh, who's riding uh, in the cities. And likewise, somebody who is a mixed road user cannot have a, sp a sporty tire there. So the purpose will not be served, and he's going to be, in the end, unhappy with the product and not on the decision uh, uh, that was taken. So one thing that we did is performance, and second, educate the customer. Tell him what, what does he want. Even our website, if you go, we ask him quite a few questions before we recommend saying, this is what is right for you. Where do you ride? Are you, is it a monsoon-heavy uh, region? The kind of roads, the terrains that you traverse, these are very important. So what we did with Eurogrip was that build a meaningful, journey for the customer also alongside and in the process build the brand now the other thing that we did was we opened our own uh, r&d center in milan in italy so we had people uh, experienced uh, people joining in now the designs are um, made in europe keeping indian conditions the rest of the we export to about 85 countries keeping in mind uh, requirements elsewhere design happens there manufacturing happens in india tested sent back to italy and japan for testing different conditions and then it of course tested in India too and then sold all over the globe so this is another change that we bring in that also goes to say that look this is a truly international brand with all the goodness of what we uh, what the rest of the world is saying built into it uh, rest of it I told you how post pandemic how we managed to push this uh, long and we've seen a massive traction um, we are market leaders in the OE space and not very far away from that position in the replacement market there. Yeah, yeah thank you for sharing. Ashish, uh, do you want to take it? I mean, you've done a great brand building exercise over the last couple of years with some very clutter-breaking communication as well. So, up to thank you for that. I'll take it as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, so this is a very interesting category, right? In the, I think in the hierarchy of insurance, people are least interested in car and bike insurance. Right? You're probably interested in life and medical and, and then, so no matter how much I think I want my consumer to really think about car insurance, they don't think about car insurance, right? So I have to, and it is a category, like thankfully it is, it, the status quo was so bad that it was easy for us to come in and, and completely disrupt it, right? The way you buy, and because we are a D2C company, right? So everything that we say, we pass on to the consumer, right? And so that's why the prices are low. But no matter how, <laughs> One learning is no matter how much you stand on the rooftop and try and tell tell people that please pay attention to this, they are not going to pay attention. They are more interested in the car than the, in the, than the insurance. And uh, then we re and when it came to communication, right? Um, so we also had this hypothesis saying a car insurance customer will never be happy because if he pays premium and then nothing happens, so <laughs> so so and if he gets a claim, then he's also upset. So dono tarike mein bas nahi bas nahi. So we had to make sure that your experiences with ACO when you're buying, or if you, uh, unfortunately if you have an accident, has to be so far superior that you know you'll 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 be you'll stick to the brand for for. Uh, and we are happy to share that you know 75 percent of our customers renew with us. You know we and the one that the 20 <laughs> three out of four renew, one that goes is probably going to go buy a new car 
and that's a whole new story udhar to we, we don't want to go there so yeah and when it came to communication we tried telling people zero commission zero commission zero commission now un- unfortunately like you know if you go rent a house you pay the landlord and you pay the broker so in your head it is very clear that i'm paying two people whereas when it came to car insurance your insurance was bundled the commission is bundled into the insurance so consumers never realize ki kaun se kaun sa commission ki baat kar raha hai i don't pay any commission right so then we had to pivot to saying how much do you save actually right and that was interesting and i'll be honest our agencies really helped us to create clutter breaking communication because it's a boring category if i do not entertain you right then you're not going to pay attention Well, thank you for sharing that story, Ashish. Yeah. Uh, let me move on to uh, Vanda and uh, Karthik, I think, because your categories that you operate in, uh, there's a significant unorganized market, as we were speaking before, the, uh, before this discussion. So uh, would you like to share your thoughts in terms of how uh, difficult it is to build a brand in this context of an unorganized sector? And how do you make it very different and meaningful for the consumer in the process? Uh, Vanda, do you want to go first? Uh, I'll keep it short. else it's my entire marketing strategy of like 200 slides but yes uh, the meat and seafood <laughs> uh, the meat and seafood category actually is a vast category it's really huge because obviously meat and seafood cost much more than tomatoes and potatoes so it's a huge category a lot of investor interest and you know 95% is unorganized and we've been buying chicken or fish from the neighborhood chicken store or you know from the wet market for forever it's So what we're trying to do is effect a habit change. And I think uh, the hallmark of every strong brand is to find the role in the life of the consumer. And every strong brand actually uh, is very clear. So I think we uh, started this journey well where we understood, you know, build on the proposition, uh, what we stood for, and also uh, the identity. In today's time and age, you know how expensive media is, right? So. uh having me to communication or the look and feel which is very similar to com- uh, to competition really results in a lot of wastage misattribution etc and every dollar is so precious so and this is not a uh you know sure shot once done ex- uh, exercise you get better at this over time so we m- did this start uh, we worked on the proposition we realized what are the key challenges what are the barriers to this category worked on that came up with very strong proposition and the look and feel also of fresh to home is very different from competition there is purple there is green it's all about freshness so the number one uh, you know uh, attribute which consumers want to buy meat and seafood is freshness and thankfully that was in our name and we realized that we own source also because we have the largest logistic network of uh trucks of boats of you know getting the entire thing to consumers so we worked on that and um, so our different communications of what we did campaigns over time is we are fresh or we are free to instill credibility getting a national celebrity like ranveer singh where he actually says uh you know that we don't fresh to home doesn't take any shortcuts so without putting anyone down they said there are temptations galore of doing all the bad things putting formal in ammonia hormones antibiotics right so did a flip and saying that there's a lot of temptation out there but we do the right thing if you actually just spoke about saying that you know this meat and seafood has no antibiotics hormones that is stable steaks right everybody actually says that but the way the communication came out the celebrity which actually drove the communication i think that worked really really well uh, for the brand uh, metrics did really well and i think over a period of time um, a biggest success is how we actually get consumers to buy meat and seafood online which is safer fresher okay karthik yeah, thanks so uh very, very similar to what vanda said we um, the, the chunk the largest chunk of uh, you know um, sort of competition would be unorganized maybe a local contractor or carpenter uh, and it's a it's a, it's a very funny uh, business uh, for instance uh, it's highly involved it's a high ticket price but it's non standardized and it's non transparent like what's the price of this nobody knows it could be 1 lakh it could be 10000 right uh, so obviously i mean the, the the place to start in in anything is you know if is there a customer need that you can uh, solve uh, and can you solve it better than what's the contemporary solution out there so 
Uh, I mean, there's a clear requirement for convenience, end-to-end -end solution, transparency, good design, good quality, um, all those things that are extremely important, especially for a purchase that you would do maybe uh, twice in your life, thrice in your life, depending. I mean, average uh, cycles of renovation about eight to 12 years, yeah? Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very thought through uh, thing, and you know, it's a very, very highly considered uh, set. Uh, so I think one, so there was a huge element of first understanding the category, and then like uh, uh, was mentioned earlier, I think we also had a huge role in education. Like, why should you even do this? So what's, what's the big deal? Uh, and it was challenging because a lot of people initially think lift space is furniture. <laughs> uh, but it's actually a full home uh, solution provider, right? It's end-to-end, -end, uh, modular kitchen, you know, everything. The whole, you, you get a bare shell home and we convert it for, uh, you know, for you to, to live in. Um, so I think once that understanding was there, I think the next thing was trying to understand, you know, how do you find uh, an insight which is, uh, you know, it's relevant. Uh, and build on that, and then make the communication as uh, uh, engaging and entertainment as entertaining as possible, especially if it's off funnel, right? Because frankly, nobody's interested in what brands have to say, right? They just there's just so much going on in their lives. They want they want something which brings a smile, something that makes them you know just relate to you know oh this could have been done with somebody else and stuff like that, and just trying to make it more memorable. I think I think Echo's done a great job at that, so I think that's why, I mean, you would remember that, right? I think so. I think the in, the intent was to get there. Um, and uh, you know, early days for us, we're still a young brand, so I think it, it, it's working fairly well, and we'll continue to invest uh, uh, in that perspective. I think the only change from an omni-channel perspective is because you have to uh, make sure that your messaging uh, is full funnel, yeah? So you will probably, as you go towards uh, the bottom of the funnel, try to make it a bit more sharper, a bit more rational, a bit more functional, call out the CTAs, irrespective of the channel. Um, but to do that with the with with the with the with the messaging that is consistent irrespective of which funnel you're at, right? So the so the the levers and the sort of the the, the proposition that you're pitching doesn't change. It just gets more specific and detailed as you go down funnel. So, yeah, yeah I think that's uh, and, and, so there. and if I can just ask you, how difficult is that? How difficult is it to keep that as a consistent message throughout? Uh, I think for a young brand, which is, uh, I think it's it's a uh, maybe you can, you can speak more about that. Uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's 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 like how many nodes do you have, right? The more nodes you have, the more complex it gets. The lesser nodes you have, the it's it's a little bit easier. Uh, for a brand which is which is us, which is fairly young, I think it, it's manageable. But I, I do see it becoming uh, a challenge as you grow larger, where there are more layers, there are more people, there are more vendors, more agencies, uh, more decentralization. Uh, so it gets a little bit challenging. So it's good to have a have a marketing playbook or a defined template to the, to the best extent that you have. Um, also, in our case, there is an element of technology and people. So okay. technology can be codified, but people have to be trained and SOP-driven. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Ashish, you want to come? Yeah. No, just to add, right? for a young brand, I think you should just try. Try what, what works. We, we don't have the playbook. And I know most people will kill me, but don't worry about your brand purpose for the first two, three years. <laughs> right? <laughs> You are still trying to figure out, you're trying to prove proof of concept, chalega, nahi chalega, kya chalega, kaise chalega. And then you get obsessed with, you know, the, unless you're, you're founded like, you know, like Patagonia, or you know, you're founded with a particular purpose, that's great. Yeah. Otherwise, we, you know, this is the sixth year of ACO, and we have now just arrived at a brand positioning. And that was done only because we said, okay, now is the time that, you know, we are branching out into other things. Yeah. That's all I want. Absolutely. No, I think it throws the usual 70, 20, 10 rule out of the window, and you've got to try a lot more than just the 10%. No, thank you. Uh, Abhinav, let me come to you. I, uh, very different category in terms of gold loans, and you had to deal with an established player like Muthoot as well. So uh, love to share your thoughts on uh, how, do you, how do you build a meaningful brand? How are you building? How are you going about it right now? Um, I wouldn't say it's all the uh, all of it is planned i wouldn't say that um, as he said you know a lot of it is trial and error but i think i can share a few things which helped us uh, do this one of it is uh, i think pretty obvious but uh, we need to truly mean it when we say when we put consumer at the heart of it uh, there are some things that the consumer does uh, does not say you know says but does not mean it so you need to decode all of that so i'll give an example so when we started uh, rupeek right when we were doing doorstep gold loans we were thinking cost is our advantage because doorstep allows us to operate at a lower opex and cost is our advantage and doorstep is something that the customer has to put up with 
uh, we didn't know that customers would love it. But as we worked through, and when we, we and we sold it like that for the first two years, and when as we worked through, we spoke to the consumers. Uh, we asked them, why did you you know take it from Rupeek? They were saying that because of doorstep is why I have taken it from Rupeek. And then when we decoded, when we you know coexisted with them for some time, we understood that these people are mostly first time borrowers of gold loan or light users of gold loan who feel very uncomfortable going out and taking gold loans from the market. So it's a social stigma which is uh, playing on their minds and they feel very warm and comfortable taking yeah. these at, the, at their homes. So uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it could have been done very more quicker uh, in terms of the journey, but uh, these things are very compounding in terms of as you discover them, then you make your brand more differentiated and meaningful at the same time because nobody has thought about it earlier. So one of the lines that uh, somebody said and it stuck with me is, uh, how do we breathe in more energy into this category, which has, uh, you know, so far been a category which is uh, viewed in a little bit of a uh, regressive light, not in such a happy manner. How do we be the Apple of gold loans? How do we be the Nike of gold loans, for example? So that's, that has been our journey so far. A great example of uh, how a brand has managed to do that in terms of getting an omni-channel strategy going uh, for a category like gold loans. Thank you. Uh, I think we uh, have about 15 more minutes. A couple of other points which I, I don't know if, if you, any of you attended the uh, talk by Divya today morning uh, from Densu. And one of the things she said is from uh, how it was 10 years back uh, in a communication uh, context, it was driven entirely by brands. It was a brand-led communication. And there was uh, absolutely no opportunity for the consumer. It was a monologue to how it is today, where it is completely consumer-led in terms of the communication, whether you talk about search or social uh, reviews that they look at, influencers whom they follow. Uh, so it's a completely different world in terms of communications uh, currently as we stand. So how do you, how do you go about, in, a, in this current context, you know, from a communication perspective where you have so many different touch points, would you like to talk about how you are, how you sort of touch upon, how you sort of make sure that the communica communication really resonates with the audience, and that you are giving control to the the consumer uh, and making sure you're listening to them? So, anyone, anyone would like to go for that? Madhu, yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, we've been waiting for this change to happen. Uh, it's not that it's happened over the last two, three years, right? A lot of it started about 10, 12 years ago. I don't even want to go back 30, 40 years back. Let's say in, during my younger days. When we go out to a restaurant with family, what did we do? We placed an order. The order gets served. What did you do next? The food came and you ate. Right? Very simple. Today, go to a restaurant. I have a 25-year-old boy and a 19-year-old girl. If we by chance go out together, that's a rarity. If they agree to come in, what happens? We go to a restaurant. We order food. The food comes. What happens next? You can't eat. You have to wait for it to be photographed, put out, try to the world, the world has to respond. Then you decide whether you have to eat till then you can't even touch however hungry you are. The entire landscape has changed, right? The thinking has changed. But it, it's been brewing for a while and it's just it's getting start just now. So what, I mean, why I said this, the animal that you're dealing with is completely different I mean, in a nicer way I'm saying this. So how do we communicate now? The, they want it to be personalized. Everybody wants to be spoken to personally. That's even more challenging. It's not anymore the one, uh, one message to all does not work. One thing that we did last year after tying up with CSK is, okay, we have CSK, great, but how do we use them well to make sure that this, whatever we want to communicate reaches the, the last mile well. So we picked up trade to see if can we do something uh, differently. So the, what came in handy was a personalized message, the rephrase AI guys did a, grand, a great job for us. Uh, Ravindra Jadeja going and mouthing, Cantabrese also did a good job of that, mouthing every shopkeeper's name as if it's their own uh, personal ad uh, that we had pulled out. And uh, saying, if you want for your tire needs, go to so-and-so tires. And pretty expensive affair, but what happened was the traction that we got is enormous. Phenomenal traction we got. And the retailers also are happy that their shop is being advertised by a list a celebrity and he was in turn sharing it happily and then supporting the brand too. Times have changed, you have to think completely differently there. Yeah, thank you for sharing that example. Uh, yeah, Vanda, you want to go next? Um, I'd like to touch upon two points. Uh, the first one is um, there are numerous channels out there and we as marketers, right, 
uh, we have to be out there on different channels, but what do you say? I think it's very, very important uh, to understand what is your brand, what do you stand for, and then not be tempted by channels first. So first comes who are you, what is the life, in a, what is your role in a consumer's life? Uh, because there are, you know, temptations galore. I'll give you an example is uh, we stand for freshness, fresh meat and seafood, etc., etc. PL is about sport. And if you do freshness, okay, what is the relevance of it? It's not a deodorant, it's not a thirst quencher, because there are a lot of contextual communication also which you have to do. So you also fall into a trap then, then you say, okay, fine, maybe I can be a protein partner, something. So there are lots of times when you actually have to make those choices of what you stand for and not give in to the temptation that, you know, there are so many other things out there and you don't live into that. So I'll give you an example also that um, one of the channels also is social media, there are influencers, etc. So we always go, uh, you know, with these vanity metrics of, you know, likes, shares, and it also becomes your brand plays second fiddle to what the influencer is. So while it's important to select the right influencer, but if you're paying for an activity, and uh, you know the tonality or what the influencer is saying doesn't accrue to your brand, then it's actually lost dollars. So it's very important first to know what you stand as a brand, make those choices because you know ROI is very very important. Moments are fleeting; it'll be viral, it'll go. But does it accrue to you? Does it build equity? Does it build top of the mind salient? So you have to make those choices. Uh, the second point I wanted to raise is, you know, gone were the days, like when I started 15 years back, it was FMCG marketing, it was, you know, a top-down approach where you were speaking to consumers. Nowadays, you're present on so many channels out there, it's far more interactive, people can speak to you, interact with you, right? You have to be open there, uh, you know, to listen to them, to address what they want. So it's far more being out there, speaking to consumers, especially as a small brand, you have the capability of going directly to consumers, listening to them, understanding them. I'll give you an example. So many consumers, right? Uh, so while we go to 180 cities in India, most of our business comes from metros. Metros, uh, people, uh, you know, they seek convenience. Many of them are youngsters who are living away from home. They don't want to cook meat and seafood. They don't know how. So they'll reach out to you on, say, social, or, you know, how do I make this? What do I do? Is this meat okay? How do I buy meat? So it's very important that you're out there, you build a team who actually addresses that and you know, onboards them really well. So they'll stick to you for a longer period of time. Gone were the days where I would make one TV campaign in a year and it would be say, okay, this is my brand, it's awesome, blah, 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 blah. Now you have to be far more, uh, you have to listen to them, far more interactive. So times are changing actually and you have to adapt your marketing and communication strategies to that. I look at it, it's very simple, and I'm sure most of my fellow agree. Marketing is as simple as it want to be, you want me to make it, or as complicated as you want to make it. You know, the people get obsessed with the tools you get, right? And every, and, and Google keeps scaring you every three months, right? I've learned something new. I, 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 do, I fundamentally believe that consumers interact with every category now in the same way. If I today have to get a, and, and let's say, live space, right? Let's space contacted us because we have a house that is getting ready. And they contacted six months ahead of us. Great. They've already contacted us. They, you know, they, they know that. It is. So being present where your consumer is buying you. So my journey is going to be, I'm going to ask, hey, you know, do you know anybody? Yes. Then I'm going to go to social. <laughs> then I'm going to go to YouTube. Then I'm going to go to watch reviews. Then I'm going to read some blogs. It's the same interaction. When it comes to car insurance, you'll also do. You'll ask somebody. You'll, so... For me, it's very very simple. Is like wherever they are searching for you or looking for you, you need to be present there with the right message. That's it. Absolutely. So I think just taking on taking off on that. I mean, is, do you feel the role of tech is being uh, overplayed right now, or do you feel there is a role for tech in terms of driving <laughs> all the consumer experiences that are happening right now? Uh, the use of tech. I mean, the use of tech data as opposed to getting creative messages across. Yeah. I, I, I don't know about uh, others, but I do believe that people are very, so tech when it comes to targeting, I think there is a lot of gray area there. Okay. <laughs> you know, there is, 
so people people will tell you that they are actually targeting the in market buyer for this and i am not sure how, to what level i can i can but there are some indicators it's not complete loss but i the other way of looking at tech is i i have personally found tech is as the most obsessed with customer satisfaction and that is a great thing to have because uh, a techie who is designing a product like, doesn't want to put one extra button <laughs> to, you know to me and they, and they are obsessed with, uh, with customer satisfaction so it's great Kathak, do you have? No, sure. Just sort of building off of that question, I think uh, just taking back to the omni-channel context, I think what technology helps you get is a one view of the customer. Yeah. So if you're investing in, I don't know, Salesforce or HubSpot, you'll at least be able to connect the guy who's called your customer service with the guy who's called your pre-sales or done engage with your chatbot. So I think it plays a role over there, uh, but it should not overpower the actual customer requirement, right? So it's there to assess, like all technologies. So I think that's the just to answer your question. Okay. Uh, maybe, Madhavan, I can I just ask you as well, because you would have had uh, uh, a lot of legacy systems in place when it comes to tires. How do you make the change and make sure that those legacy systems don't kind of bog you down when you move into an omnichannel world uh, for tires? Absolutely, right? We, we were all painting the entire canvas with only one way right through. Um, that's changed. That's for sure changed. And tire, I mean, I, while I say tire, it's a round black thing. The amount of technolo uh, in, uh, uh, technology that is required and that's going into it, it's not funny. The, the first job is to keep you safe and then only the rest of the uh, uh, frills there. So how do, we, how do we use technology to communicate? How do we use technology to in further the value that all we, we already we bring? That's, that's a given there. So is it, is it going to be uh, technology only going to be the way forward? Not necessary, but you'll use it as an enabler. We've been doing that in the last year and a half, two years, quite a bit. As you said, the legacy systems are there. We have to learn to quickly drop those, and we are making all the effort to do that. I mean, I don't know if you're a 40-year-old brand. So there is a certain way that we've got used to living, and we're living it differently now. We can get into details, but uh, not to stretch this further. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I think we've got a few minutes. So last question, probably the most difficult one. I'm going to ask you to look into the future. And uh, from an omni-channel perspective, what do you, how do you see the consumer experience progressing over the next few years? Uh, how do you see that changing? And what does the future hold? Um, any of you would like to take a crack at that? I mean, uh, somewhere I read about a few years back, only 7% of the people looked at three or four different touch points and not more. Today, seven, eight is common for a category like ours, uh, unlike his, where it's high involvement, high engagement, zero, literally next to nothing involvement and engagement. Still about four, five, six uh, uh, opportunities are looked at. It, you're going to live with this. People are going to look at everything and then come back to where they're comfortable. That's something which is going to be there. Okay. I think the bar is also... Sorry, Sorry go ahead. I think the bar is also super high now. Uh, earlier... Uh, you know, you have to research about a brand. As he said, there are four or five areas where you would look at them. Now you have to be present everywhere. The reviews have to be good. So you need to deliver that kind of experience to the customer. So the bar for somebody to judge uh, that you are the brand to go ahead with has become super high. So I think we need the industry needs to do a good enough job uh, and generally up its standards to win customer these days. Uh, I think uh, omni-channel uh, strategy going forward will be forgetting the channel and looking at the person who's buying your product, your services, or using them, right? Look at it as consumer first. It's very easy for us to think of channel A, B, C, retail, etc. But think of it, right? This is Vanda. Uh, she wants to have Starbucks, right? And look at the brilliant way in which Starbucks actually has revolutionized it. So uh, when we used to have loyalty cards, remember those good old days, we used to have a physical card and then you used to go to Lifestyle or Costa Coffee and used to show it. And who used to even keep that card? Now in Starbucks, right, if you have uh, their famed uh, program, you can pay through it in, and you can top it up in any part of the world. You can load your coins. And if you're standing in line, right, and you actually want a frappuccino, and you realize that you have less money, you can load it up through any, you can load it up through, uh, through mobile, through net banking, anything, you load up the card, 
And the beauty of it is in real time it reflects. So by the time you reach a barista, he already knows and you can actually swipe it. Look at Disney. Their uh, experience is so beautiful on their, on their website, right? You can book an experience to go to Disneyland. You can book a ticket. When you're there, right, you can buy a popcorn. You can, it's so seamless, right? They don't look at you, okay, you have come through retail or you have come through this. And then if you have a problem, you have to call customer care or your app doesn't support it, your website. It's nothing like that. It's a seamless experience of how you actually go and buy a thing. And I think if tech enables this, right, and everything is seen from a consumer perspective, and you make every channel actually fire to deliver stellar consumer experience, you're there. It's not there right now, but I think eventually everything will move that way. Another brilliant ex uh, example is Lenskart, right? They don't tell you, okay, you've come and bought from the app, or you've come from, uh, you know, the store. They actually see that even if you're buying it on the app, right, you should not have an experience which is anything less than a store. So imagine your face, the contours of your face, you try your lenses, whether you want square, you want round, so there's nothing lacking in that experience. So even when you go to the store, they just pull up your, and they see, okay, this is your history, this is what you've bought in the past, okay, you want this solution. So it's so beautiful, it's seamless, right? So I think all businesses will actually have to move to this kind of experience. Great example, yeah, thank I you. I think it depends, on, for me, it depends upon what kind of business you are in. So Live Space needs to have a store. Because I actually do want to go there. You know, even if you have an immersive and metaversely website, I would still want to come and see your see your product, right? Amazon ke koi do, there's no shop, there's no office of Amazon, and we don't no consumers don't expect Amazon to have an office, right? Uh, so certain category, it was very interesting ten years or eleven years back when Apple launched the first store, right? And it changed retail altogether. How you experience a product, product and come and spend time there. So I think it depends on which kind of business you are in, and, if the, and then obviously d dictates your distribution strategy and your channels. Oh, thank you, thank you. I think we are uh, pretty much close on time. Uh, so maybe, maybe a few questions from the audience, if you can give five more minutes. Any, anyone? Oh, you're already late, okay. Uh, no questions? I think you'll have to do it during the lunch break. Yeah, but thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Vanda. Thank you, guys.